I am Veronica Woodruff. I am with Stewardship Pemberton Society. I am also part of the Pemberton Wildlife Association, and I work as an environmental consultant for a company called Ecofish. I would like to welcome Worcester based Leslie Anthony. He holds a PhD in zoology from the University of Toronto. He is an author of the book Snake Bit Confessions of a Herpetologist. Skiing, however, has always remained a passion, which explains how he moved from respected, well published scientists to his more familiar role as editors of magazines like Powder and Skier. We would like to welcome Dr. Anthony and thank him for coming here for a celebration of Pemberton's biodiversity. To start, a lot of this material is derived from a paper that I presented this summer at the Canadian Amphibian and Reptile Conservation Network meetings in, in Quebec. It's kind of a little egg-headed when you read this kind of title. This is the kind of thing scientists tend to come up with. Because even when I was a respected scientist out in the field collecting, everyone thought it pretty much looked like a summer vacation. I don't know if anybody's been to Whistler's annual BioBlitz event. Every year, I would volunteer to go out and catch a few little creatures for the kids to look at during this BioBlitz. And of course, I was just catching them in Whistler. There's not much in Whistler. There's a garter snake, there's an alligator lizard. One year, I got really bored and thought, these kids need something new. So in 2011, I decided I was going to go up to Pemberton and get a rubber boa. Even people who don't like snakes like rubber boas. They never bite. They're crazy weird. They look like toys, and kids love them. I went to a place where I knew people often saw rubber boas on the trails in spring, pulled open a pile of logs, and instead of rubber boa, I found this. This was a big surprise, because this was a shark-tailed snake, and a shark-tailed snake had never been found on the British Columbia mainland in 200 years of searching. This turned out to be fairly big news. It wasn't just public news, it was big news in science circles because these animals turn out to be total phantoms and they're incredibly cryptic, rarely seen. And how cryptic are they? Well, if you look at these scientific papers, you see cryptic enough that two different forms of the species living together in one place, cryptic enough that sightings were 60 years apart, and of course, cryptic enough that there is a uh, philosophical military metaphor being erected to describe their behavior. At any rate, the animal is pretty unique. These are the four aspects in which the shark-tailed snake is fairly unique. I don't know if anyone knows what phylogeny means, but phylogeny basically has to do with what is an animal related to? Where did it come from? Which species is it a relative of and which species is it not a relative of? This sharp-tailed snake is a relative of nothing. On the tree of life, it's way out at the end of some tiny little branch hanging by itself. It's got no relatives in North America. There's no relatives in Asia. Nobody has a clue what family it's even in. That means it's probably been here on the coast for tens of millions of years. And from a biological standpoint, there's a lot of other strange things about it. To start with, by its name, you know that it has this crazy pointy little sharp tail. Nobody knows what that's all about. Everyone looks at it and thinks, well, it's like a thorn. Of course, they use it to stick in things, and, but that doesn't seem to be the case. Some people think it's used as an anchor when they are eating their favorite prey, which is slugs. But the underside of this animal is black and white stripes. What is a burrowing animal doing with a black and white striped belt? That's called aposematic coloration. That's a warning color system. What is it warning? Some people think it's maybe imitating poisonous centipedes or millipedes. In this part of the world, at this latitude, almost all the reptiles are live buried. Nobody lays eggs. They all have live young because there's not enough heat at this latitude generally to incubate eggs. But these guys somehow lay eggs. They found a way. So they obviously are looking for little microhabitats in which they can lay eggs and have enough heat to incubate. If we get up into Washington and BC, you can see that they're very spottily distributed. Even within these very disparate, far removed areas, there's only certain places where they're found. The Pemberton record is quite a range extension. That's a big deal. It's a long way away from anywhere else where these things have actually been found before. 
the Pemberton population, the most northern population of sharp-tailed snakes known. So despite diking and extensive agriculture, this is one of the last remaining large, relatively intact valleys in British Columbia. It's ecologically unique because we got two biogeoclimatic zones meeting here. As soon as you start driving towards Darcy, you see really quickly how you get into this interior Douglas fir. As soon as you start going up to the upper little bit, you see how you're getting into coastal western hemlock. So we got plant and animal elements from these two major biogeoclimatic zones and they're all mixing in the Pemberton Valley, which kind of doesn't happen anywhere else in the province. And then we've got this particular sort of weird dry ecosystem on the south facing hillside, which is very much like the Gulf Islands and quite unique for certain plants and things. Again, this is something that you don't find anywhere else. There's actually no other valleys around here between here and the coast that exhibit these particular types of characteristics. Lillooet River, everyone's familiar with it. It's kind of under the whole valley from one side to another, and that's why we have a bunch of wetlands and uh, cottonwood trees, which are kind of a thing unto themselves. And uh, there's still a lot of them here, and they're still very much a part of the ecosystem. In terms of biodiversity, this is, a, this is a large number of reptiles and amphibians. I'll bet you've maybe seen a third of them, if that. They don't all show up at the same time of year. They don't all show up in large numbers. Some of them don't even show their faces at all. We only have one red-listed species in Pemberton, and that is the sharp tail snake. We've got a couple of blue-listed species, but the rest are yellow, which means non-threatened. Then there's another designation here, which is the Federal Species of Risk Act Schedule 1 designation. And Schedule 1 is pretty serious. And there's one, two, three, four, five of these guys. This is the most common <coughs> reptile, or at least the most commonly seen reptile in the valley, the wandering garter snake. Um, it's almost impossible not to have seen one of these things. And this is their their cousin, the valley garter snake. Some people call them the red racers because they have these bright red bars on their side. This is the alligator lizard. Very common animal everywhere, gardens. Uh, Long-toed salamander. This is a western redback salamander from One Mile Lake Nature Center. This is kind of interesting. I found this a few years ago and didn't really think it was a big deal. And then I started looking at range maps and I was like, wait a minute. This is about the furthest inland that this thing has ever been found. And Satina salamander. This is that red-legged frog I was talking about. This is a federally listed species at risk. Pacific chorus frog used to be called the tree frog. It's in pretty much everywhere you look around here, although not always the easiest to see, and the coastal tail frog. So when you find a new population of an endangered species and you're a field biologist, you're like, oh my god, I've got to find more. Well, I sort of set out to do that the following year. In the little window that you have with these animals, which is when they're coming out of their dens in the spring, you manage to find four new sites and uh, Seven new specimens that included two babies, neonates, just hatched, probably in the fall. Two den sites, but I started thinking, okay, I should be able to find more of these. The habitat here is, is really good on this hillside. And these guys are kind of burrowers. So there's all these little spaces and everything, and they're small, and they get into there, and they're really hard to find, so I wanted to up the probability of being able to find snakes. I, I need to find some methods that were going to help me find new sites and new populations. You can see that these babies are, are ridiculously tiny. Fortunately, they're very brightly colored though, so when you do come across one, you kind of know immediately what it is. So what I did was I went to Victoria, and the only other sharp-tailed snake populations in Canada that are known are on the southern tip of Vancouver Island and on some of the Gulf Islands. There is a provincial shark tail snake recovery team. My friend Pernima is a reptile, amphibian, and small mammal biologist with the Ministry of the Environment. And uh, the guy next to her, Christian Engelstock, he, he's a, a wildlife biologist, um, 
particularly a species of risk biologist, but he has published almost everything that is known about sharp-tailed snakes in Canada in the scientific literature. He's an author on the paper. Well, it turns out that these open kind of areas, open forest areas, are all kind of on hilltops in Victoria. Or it seemed like most of their sites were on hilltops. Perhaps that's because uh, other sites had been removed or whatnot. And I realized that we didn't exactly have this type of habitat in Pemberton, and I didn't know how I was going to transfer any of this knowledge. So I started looking in those areas. There's a lot of this stuff on the hillside. Uh, Mackenzie Ridge can, you know, basically claim seven sites and 13 snakes with 600 hours of searching. Getting out there early in the spring, started to find a lot of rubber boas and a lot of rubber boa dens. And it turned out that some of the areas we were finding the shark tail snakes in the spring were the same areas that the rubber boa dens were in. So we're also finding the hatchlings, shark tail hatchlings. So as it turns out, of, of the seven rubber boa den sites that I've been able to identify so far, three of them are also shark tail snake den sites. This actually isn't unusual with snakes, multi-species communal denning. It's because den sites have to be very particular. They have to be above the water line, below the frost line, kind of have the right mix of humidity and heat through the winter. So different species tend to all find these places and they end up sharing them through the winter. On Mackenzie Ridge, there's at least one site where all four species of snakes are all denning in the same spot. And they all come out in the spring and they're all sunning you know, in the same place. They hang around there for a few weeks before they disperse. This is kind of a view that most people in Pemberton have of this ridge. Everybody knows it as a site for recreation. There's tons of trails running all over the place. And every one of these user groups makes a little tiny bit of impact here and there. All of these are private land parcels here. And so some of them, most of them are in various stages of the development process. And just for reference sake, this is the area of the one that is the furthest in the development process. This is where Stewardship Pemberton comes into the picture. These guys applied for a Habitat Conservation Trust Fund grant in 2013 which was aimed at some conservation initiatives around the shark tail snake. Establish these locations and see if I could find any more populations. <clears throat> find out what other species are occurring in this area. So when you get into the literature, you find it with cryptic animals, things that have very specific habitat requirements. This habitat suitability and gap analysis is something that gets done a lot. And it's pretty easy to understand. Basically, they take all the criteria that they know about an animal, what it likes to eat, what kind of weather it likes, what kind of rocks it likes, what kind of vegetation, soil, anything like that, elevation, and they plug it into a mathematical equation. So in this case, in Washington State, they came up with habitat areas that were flagged by these algorithms that they pumped out. When you map the sites, the known records they have in museum collections onto those algorithmically generated polygons, you see that every single record in Washington fits into one of those things. So they were able to predict which places you would find sharp tail snakes even though they didn't have that locality data. In 200 years, they have 18 locations. There's only 20 snakes. That means 16 of those locations, probably one snake each. Okay, now we know where we should be looking. And they went out and looked. And in the 10 years since they did that, they now have dozens of locations and hundreds of records. So 200 years, 20 records, 10 years using the right tools to focus, they got hundreds. Turns out a very similar tool is being used on Salt Spring Island by the uh, Conservancy Group there. And they're working with Crown Land, and they're also working with uh, private landowners. There's Salt Spring there. So Salt Spring is one of the places where sharp-tailed snakes are uh, not common, because they're not common anywhere, but 
where they, there are a number of sites. It's the same thing, they come up with these polygons, these probabilities, here's the areas where they might be, and they're working with landowners, and the landowners are like, okay, so I'm in that polygon, and uh, then they fill out this sort of virtual habitat assessment, which tells them which areas within their property they might look, and a lot of populations have been identified this way, and it's been great because now the landowners are doing the protective. Let's just say heat is the most important thing. And we use the sun tracker function on Google Earth. Any day of the year, that shows you where the sun will track across that map. And we just picked out from April to October where the warmest places in the valley would be based on the sun tracker function. And it turned out that all of our sites were in the central polygon, the biggest polygon here. But it turns out that the two sites that we found this year are in those polygons too. But this is a good thing, and you also see that there's a lot of other areas that we, we can still investigate. Some of these are probably erroneous because they're, the sun might be tracking over them, but they're flat, or they're high altitude, they're not quite the sort of south-facing ridges that we want. So one of the things that we've been doing to try and help us uh, find these animals on those areas is we've been using artificial cover on it. Two new sites we found this year were both found by using artificial cover objects. The first site, a volunteer actually looked under this piece of cover when she was mountain biking, took a picture with her phone, and then we found that snake under the same cover object a couple of times, and also another one in the same area under another one. And recently in October, I found a baby sharp tail snake under a piece of artificial cover down at the other end of the valley. I just wanted to touch on the community outreach stuff that uh, Stewardship Pemberton has been doing um, and the worth of it. It's uh, not just aimed at finding sharp tail snakes, but it's aimed at conservation efforts for all the reptiles and amphibians in the valley. There's a lot of roads and trails and pathways in Pemberton, in particular against that south-facing valley wall. And these animals are crossing those things day and night from April to October in the hundreds, like constant. But this is what happens with this going on. Um, it's sort of inevitable. But this happens a lot, and um, essentially happens every day. And again, dozens to hundreds of dead animals every single day, just on the, the small network of roads and trails that we have. And I should point out that it's not just roads, like mountain bike trails as well, right? Like a baby rubber boa, it's only about that big. It's kind of hard to see it when you're moving fast. As you increase the number of roads and trails, obviously, and if you don't increase awareness, it's going to be a problem. This is why that is happening. Reptiles tend to overwinter and reproduce up on the hillsides above the valley, come down to the valley for foraging in summer. Some of the movements are, some just come down, spend the summer, go back up. So you've got amphibians basically in the bottomlands going up. You've got reptiles in the highlands coming down. This is the situation of the Okanagan. It's home to 30% of BC's red-listed wildlife species, 46% of the province's blue-listed species. These are the problems of development. 15 red-listed birds, blue-listed birds, same number, and growing owls, sage grouse, sharp-tailed grouse, gone. Mammals, four red-listed, 15 blue-listed, white-tailed jackrabbits, extirpated. I've got this amazing Sort of biodiversity here in Pemberton. Basically, we've got a few conservation concerns here, but for the most part, uh, there's a lot of mellow yellow. By and large, Pemberton has a fairly intact ecosystem. Obviously, the impetus is to preserve that because you don't want to end up like the Okanagan. Tiger salamander, probably extirpated this year, it was down to one site. Desert night snake was only found in 1980, was already red listed and a species at risk by then. All of these other animals are federally species at risk and blue listed provincially. It's just like a tiny little contingent 
of garter snakes, which you can't destroy with anything. And <laughs> long toed salamanders, which are kind of the same. Okay, so found a sharp tailed snake on the mainland. What are the chances that you could find some more? Well, British Columbia is a bit of a labyrinth. You, you don't even know what you're dealing with. There are places where there's no roads in or anything. Even the chances are probably good that there's another population of sharp tailed snakes on the mainland somewhere in British Columbia. I don't know where. I don't know where it would be warm enough, but it's probably there. But that doesn't diminish how special it is to find them in Pemberton and to have the northernmost known population here, the absolute limit of the species and the fact that it contributes to all this fantastic biodiversity. So you can see by what Leslie said, it's, it was exciting for us. This snake gave us the incentive to apply for this ACTF grant because our town is a small one. They don't have an uh, environmental department some, like some larger municipalities. And said, well, let's give the village some support in this and try to offer them some tools that they can use in this development permit process. So because so it's that hillside area where we have that those th those large blocks of um, private land, really that whole uh, hillside above the gravel pit area there is private land and it is slated for development sometime off in the future and it's become part of this hillside special planning area. And the lowest of the sites, and they were brought into this urban growth boundary in October 2011 and, um, and designated as development permit area, which brings the village planning staff to basically make the rules on how that development is going to proceed. And part of that is there's an uh, environmental component there. So the village staff has been incredibly proactive. Um, they have included many actions through this development permit process for the protection of species as these developments move forward. Um, they have written specific action items into the development permits and environmental work plans for the developments as they proceed that they are to address, um, developers are to address the species as it moves forward and provide mitigation strategies. And um, they've really taken a proactive approach for dealing with our concerns as well as developers and trying to um, bring the sites together. Also, as part of that grant, because we knew that there was more players than just us in the village, we wanted to offer the developers a chance to hear what our concerns might be in terms of larger scale development, like subdivision growth. We wanted to sit at the table and just explain some of the current concerns that we had in terms of species and also discuss mitigation strategies that we think might work when you're looking at larger scale development. There's a real opportunity to get in, to get comment in to development at this stage because <coughs> unlike the Okanagan where they're dealing reactively, we can sit at the table and we can talk about what strategies might work. Whether that be in the layout or in construction or designating leave areas. And so that's what we tried to initiate that conversation. And where we're at with that, the um, village of Pemberton is um, initiating a round table uh, discussion that will bring the developers in the village of Pemberton uh, and our concerns, and we can all sit around the table and discuss those concerns, so we're looking really forward to that. And also, being part of this, um, with the grant, there's other parallel projects that are going on. There's one through the South Coast Conservation Program that is developing planning tools for the entire South Coast region and the village of Pemberton and the Sharp Tail Snake specifically has become the pilot project for that. And uh, we have a meeting next week, a presentation there with the South Coast Conservation Program, which will host all the municipalities between here and Abbotsford and all the different planning staff there and discuss how you implement environmental protection when you deal with these large development permit areas. <laughs> Sharp Tail Snake was an exciting find. And it's here to stay, and I look forward to how this story plays out. I'm sure that we are, it's something to celebrate in the future. I think in terms of development and what that hillside's going to look like in 20 years, it can be a story that we can all stand back and say, we did it right. And the landowner can look and uh, you know, take, take that real stewardship approach and see that we've preserved these species and the uni uniqueness of that hillside, and we have this viable economy that's, that goes with that uh, increased development.